Hey, what's going on, everyone? Glenn here from FakeChimp.net and Good Movie Monday. Cheers for pressing play. This is the final installment of our summer series. Thanks so much for um for watching these over the course of the summer. It's been a it's been a blast bringing them to you. Of course, our show Good Movie Monday has been on a break. We are returning on March the first, which is next week, and um, we cannot wait to get stuck back into it. But yeah, we've bought you a whole bunch of stuff, um, you know, over the last few months, and um, we've really appreciated you guys watching. Uh, last week we talked to Rolf de here about his films Dingo and Bad Boy Bubby. And to wrap things up this week, we have got the star of Bad Boy Bubby, Bubby himself, Nicholas Hope, to discuss all things about the film. And um, the the interview was originally published at the MonsterFest website as a, uh, two, a two-piece interview article, and we thought we'd give you the uncut version of that here. And so, without further ado, let's throw to Nicholas Hope. Before we do, real quick, just a mention that there is some technical um, snafus, I guess you could say, with this uh, this video, uh, more so the presentation. Uh, we had some uh, some glitches in the Zoom um, broadcast, if you will, and so we've done our best to to <laughs> to put it together. So it will occasionally jump from uh, split screen to full screen. Um, depending on who's talking, but uh, the audio is completely intact and I uh, don't think it diminishes anything whatsoever about the uh, conversation. So here it is, Nicholas Hope. Enjoy, and I'll see you at the other side. Hey, Nicholas, how are you? I'm good, thanks, Len. How are you? Really good. It's a pleasure to be speaking with you. Thank you. I was, um, I was talking to Rolf last week, um, and I mentioned to him the 25th anniversary screening at Monsterfest back in 2018, you were there. I, I will never forget it because about 20 minutes into the film, some woman stood up and chastised the entire audience, screaming that they were all sick perverts, and then she stormed out of the room. Does it surprise you that Bubby still polarizes people all these years later? Um, it doesn't surprise me, really, uh, because I think it, it sort of touched on... on social issues that are still uh, very, very extant, um, especially, you know, it was ahead of its time in looking at uh, the way we perceive body shape. You know, it's, it's uh, the character's attraction is to people who would be considered um, not, not part of normal beauty regimes. Um, he he has learned to respond to people in a completely inappropriate way. But because of the way the film is made, we're very sympathetic to that, and therefore there's there's a kind of cognitive dissonance when he responds like that, and you know that if that was you, he was responding to you would feel attacked and impinged on. But oh, it's, it's Bobby, so it's fine. I mean, that's, that, you know, that's kind of confronting. And then the whole religious stuff is that when you have something that people believe in totally, and it has absolutely no basis in any kind of proof, or anything that you can say is factual. It is, as they say, pure faith. And it's actually reasonably easy to come up with arguments against it. So if you've got people who are absolutely believing in that and they have defined their life around it, and then you have something which confronts it, that's really confronting. And I wasn't there for the woman walking out. Oh, I couldn't. Well, before she walked out, she probably spent ten minutes chastising people from a seated position. You know, why? Why are you laughing? I don't understand. You're sick perverts and all this kind of stuff. Until somebody yelled out, "Shut the fuck up! The boat has sailed." You know, it's Twenty-five years later, you miss that one. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah. The, the very first screening in Norway. It did really well in Norway. Um, the the person who was screening it got up and said, please remember you are allowed to laugh. <laughs> and I actually think that 
is one of the reasons it did well because yeah, that that's... first audience laughed at a lot of the uncomfortable bits because they're, they're so bizarre and had been set up to sort of, I suppose, unconsciously know that that first section is going to go somewhere else. Yeah. Um, and I think that created a word of mouth. That's a, that's an excellent way to approach any kind of exhibition of it. Like, you know, just let people know, lull them into that sense of security. You know, this is okay. Yeah, because that's what Rolf was saying, is he just wished that that woman had persevered for just a little bit longer. Yeah. Because then he went on to tell me about the film winning religious awards, you know, at a certain film festival, you know, which makes sense to me when you watch the whole arc of the story. Upon its release, um, notable film critic David Stratton declared Bad Boy Bubby to be a milestone for Australian cinema, which perhaps you guys dodged a bullet because only one year earlier, he um, he completely denounced Romper Stomper for being a blemish on Australian cinema, both very different films, obviously, but both very confrontational and provocative. Um, were you guys surprised at the time by the um, the positive response that Bubby had? Um, I, I can't speak for Rolf, but I, I was um, really naive at the time. Uh, I recognised that the script was something quite amazing but i have to admit that um i was just over the moon at the fact that i was i was in it yeah it was you know my first feature film role was the lead in something which was the kind of film that i would like to watch that was more or less as far as it sort of went for me at the time um then the responses that it got, yes, that it was, it was painful to say it. It was a surprise, but it was an egocentric surprise for me more than anything else. I was, for, for quite some time, I was just totally taken up in that, that world of how wonderful this is happening to me. I think you're allowed to feel that way. I mean, it was your first film, like anybody would. Yeah, but it's, um, I don't think it served me particularly well to feel that way. Um, uh, it would have been better to have some distance from it. Yeah, and, and Rolf is the type of guy that never makes the same film twice. And, and despite being so diverse, but they all have a really distinct voice each unto their own. What kind of director is he to work with? He was fantastic um, in that, you know, early on, he brought me in two weeks early. Uh, he said for rehearsal, but in actual fact, it was simply because he recognized I hadn't done a feature film before. And uh, it was just to be around the office and slowly get to know all the people who were going to be the main people working on the film. Um, so that I was really quite comfortable with them. Then he got me to take, to, to to carry the first set of rehearsals. And I didn't know really how to, so I did theatre style rehearsals. Uh, but again, it broke down a whole load of barriers between me and all the people that I was going to be doing confronting things with and they were going to be doing confronting things with me. Um, that was great. And then he very quickly worked out that because of all that, I was fairly aware of how I thought the character should go. And he didn't, he just watched over that. And if it was going wrong, he'd step in, but otherwise he'd throw it over. He'd say, so what are you going to do? And we'd do it and then he'd tweak it. That meant that from my point of view, um, I had a lot of control, but I had control without feeling fearsome about it because I worked out pretty quickly that if what I suggested wasn't going to work, there was someone who'd make it work. Yeah. So. Fantastic. And yeah, he invited everyone in the crew to come up with any ideas. And he said 99.9% .9 of them will be rejected. But that 0.1% <laughs> is going to make a great difference to the film. 
it's a great way of, of approaching it. And out, out of curiosity, do you have a favorite film of his? Well, it would have to be that. And it's, it's purely because of that um, investment um, yeah. in it. For sure. He considers it to be his most experimental film. And uh, famously, he had 32 different cinematographers uh, just to sort of represent Bubby in the outside world. Was that a challenge for you as an actor or did it make little difference in terms of performance? Um, it, I didn't know any different. Yeah, yeah. So it was just what was. That's what happened. Um, at the time, I wasn't even aware what the director of photography actually meant. Mm -hmm. And um, it just meant a few other people were coming up each day saying, we're going to be doing this. And, and they would take a little more control, you know, they would say, can you start from here and walk along this line? And, and that was actually, by the time we got there, because they didn't, that didn't kick in until after the first two weeks filming. Mm -hmm. um, so by the time we got there, I thought, this is, this is great. It was a bit of a, it was a difference. And suddenly there were more restrictions and you had to find ways within the restriction. And sometimes restriction can actually give you more freedom. So it was, uh, it, it wasn't challenging in that way. Yep. The most challenging thing was uh, sometimes there were much, this is only one or two. Sometimes they were much less interested in what I was doing, what the character was doing than just in the lights and mm -hmm. shape. And by that time, I had a very high sense of myself and I thought I should be the most important thing there. <laughs> and now, uh, and that's how I was seeing it. Uh, if I look at it now, they would have come in and they were coming into something which was fairly well oiled. It was moving very well. And the person who was, you know, if the camera's not on them, it's that point of view and they, they kept that kind of uh, that scenario and it was fairly obvious that he me was reasonably in control of that so they didn't need to pay much attention uh, which is kind of as it should be but i wasn't seeing it that way i was a little i'd i was going through a bit of a petulant child <laughs> it must have been a very daunting thing for those cinematographers because they weren't allowed to see each other's footage and things like that you know I, I can't even imagine how that would work but it obviously it pays off in the end product um rolf at one point said that he had wanted it to be more experimental but mm -hmm. what each person tended to do was they, they'd have good, really good ideas but then they would kind of um, even them out. So they wouldn't take really strong risks with the lighting. You know, from Rolf's point of view, we could have had that character coming out and he had no reference for color. So you, you could have had a bright yellow sky and purple mm. grass because that's what the character sees if you wanted. And then you could have changed it the next time. Now, that would have been interesting, but it, the film would have been much less of a cult, I think, than it already was. Uh, so the fact that they evened it out was um, probably useful for the film. For sure. Have you ever been asked to reprise the role of Bubby? Yes. Um, there was, shortly afterwards, there was somebody who wanted to do a series for SBS, which was based on the idea of a character who'd been in a room all his life and then every time he went out of the room it was all new mm. um and i'd only just come out of bobby and I, th I thought it would be a mistake to to do that i don't know whether it would have been or not i would have had a job which didn't happen for a long time after <laughs> uh and then there's been a few people keep saying we should do a sequel I have no idea what I think of that. <laughs> I was about to say, where do you think Bubby would be today, almost 30 years later? Exactly. Where would he? You know, um, what do you do? What do you do with that? Yeah. Yeah. Did he become a pop star? Did he? 
did he become so aware of his own, you know, bubby persona that that's what he has to hang on to in order to survive? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't think it should be done, but it, it's an interesting premise for sure. Um, and I think you kind of, you kind of answered this for me a moment ago, but um, it's a bit of an ignorant question, I guess. But Bad Boy Bubby, has it, a, has it afforded you the privilege of not having to audition much in, in the mean, you know, since the release? No. Not really. Um, it it launched me into film, and oddly enough, swiped me out of theatre. Right. So, you know, I, I on a personal basis, I should have actually left the country and gone to a, a, a larger area, mm. and and I made a number of decisions which were probably not useful, but. Um, Instead, I went to Sydney, came to, came to Sydney. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't known in theatre in Sydney, so nobody, uh, I can't even get an audition in Sydney. So, but and it, that makes a certain amount of sense because of the age at which I came here. Yeah. Um, but it launched me into film, but it launched me into, you know, I came into film with a particular reputation, which mm -hmm. was the crazy. Yeah. Um, so uh, I don't often have to audition for the crazy parts that are that come my way, but for anything else, I definitely have to audition. I was going to say, I imagine that you'd be one of those light bulb moments in a lot of casting directors' minds. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it feels like it's a pretty dim light bulb. <laughs> my, uh, <laughs> my, my face always lights up whenever I see you appear on the screen, um, particularly recently when you popped up in The Invisible Man and Ash vs. Evil Dead and Truth, you know, working with Robert Redford. That's incredible. How did that one come about, just as a bit of a digression? That was an audition. Yeah. Um, and that guy was... Um, he, he was... It was one of the nicest auditions I've had. We were, you know, so... I did the first audition and then there was a callback and the director was there for the callback. And he said, can you do it this way? Can you do it that way? Can you do it the other way? Can and then he stopped and he said, Nicholas, I'm really sorry because most of these have got nothing to do with how I want to do it. You, you do understand. I'm just actually seeing what it's like working with you. Oh. And I thought that was just lovely. And then he did it, we did it about another three ways. And he said, okay, thanks. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. He was, he was a very nice director. Well, I'm almost out of time. There's probably someone else waiting in the wings. But have you had a chance to see the illustration of you on the the Umbrella Blu-ray release? No. I'll I don't show you. That. If I can hold this up to camera. Oh, wow. <laughs> How good is that? You need, to, you need to get that framed and put on your wall. It's amazing. Yeah, that looks fantastic. So it's a really exciting release. It's great to see Bubby um, preserved like this. Obviously, um, Rolf was telling me about you know the um, the restoration of the film. It's nice now to have it in a physical format for people to have at home on Blu-ray. Yes, it is. It is, and uh, I'm immensely proud that the film has survived this long. Absolutely, and yes. you be should alive. be. You should be. It's one of those iconic things that um, I think will be around for a lot longer. Yeah. Well, mate, um, thank you so much for your time. Um, thank you for the chat. It's been an absolute pleasure for me. Thank you, Glenn. A pleasure for me too. And that is a wrap. Summer series. Let's put that one in the can. Uh, until next summer, I guess, when we'll probably do it all over again. Um, but yeah, how good was that? Nicholas Hope, what a legend. Uh, what a nice guy. It was a fantastic chat to have. And I hope you enjoyed it. And um, like I said, that brings us to the end. And so, as of next week, Good Movie Monday is back every week, every single Monday. And boy, do we have some huge, huge guests lined up. We've got some uh, Hollywood royalty on the show. Uh, we've got some Australian film royalty on the show and a whole bunch of other stuff to come over the, over the course of the next 12 months. So, um, guys, we'll see you there. Keep following us on the... <laughs> keep following us on the socials, uh, primarily... Facebook, and um, we are on Twitter, we are on YouTube, actually hit up our YouTube, subscribe to our YouTube, that's where we need the love the most, and um, see you on the show, ciao. At first, he did seem to spend a lot of time alone. 
Mum looked after him. Although sometimes she called him her bad boy, Bubby. And there was always Cat to play with. Then one day... Hey, son, you can call me Pop. Pop came back, and everything changed. All right, don't go making a big thing of it. Bad boy Bubby went on a voyage of discovery. And the world he confronted was funny. Get off the ride, you fucking poop the bastard! <laughs> Tragic. Loving and hateful. Get off the fucking ride, you fucking crazy bastard! This is oh, shit! Yes. Honest. Cat. And hypocritical. God doesn't like that. <laughs> and totally unlike any you've ever hey, seen before. <laughs> God, you've got great tits. Great big whoppers of things. We proudly present an extraordinary <laughs> film by Rolf de Heer, starring Nicholas Hope as bad boy Bubby, and delightfully supported Please by Claire Benito, Ralph Cottrell, and Carmel Johnson. Bad boy puppy, all he needs is love. <laughs>